I don't know. Can you guys can hear me? Oh, yeah, there we go. You. Yes. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Started, you just started the webinar, though. Uh, I just started it. I didn't mean. Started the broadcast or not? Is audio not connected? So we'll have to see. Attendees still on hold. Yeah, so start the broadcast. I just clicked it. It's not doing anything. I have no idea. It shows. It's not doing a darn thing. Because attendees started joining. Um... I can see, well, I can see attendees say... filing in, but I don't. I don't have any button which I normally do that says your broadcast is on. You started the broadcast. And I do, but it doesn't, it's not working. It just keeps, I click, 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 and it just keeps doing, it doesn't do anything. It just keeps going back to start broadcast, start broadcast. Okay, so let me just do this. Uh, if anybody from our attendees can hear us, can you type in the chat? Let us know that you hear and see us. We do have 21 joining. It says in my thing it says attendees are right. on hold. Right. On they're, hold. they're showing up in the questions, so that's great. All right, we'll get started. Thanks for everybody's patience on this. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Religious Accommodation in the Time of COVID, Our Blessing and Our Burden. I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could all join us. Some housekeeping instructions off the top. This webinar is being recorded. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding your audio or visual, please type those into the chat box located in the platform's dashboard. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions for our presenters by typing your questions into the questions box of the control panel, also located in the platform's dashboard. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and hope to include them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I'd like to share a couple slides with you before we begin. We had a number of webinars last week for Spiritual Care Week. If you happen to miss those, all the recordings, all the materials, all the resources are available on up on our website. You can either click on the QR code or use the URL code. Um, we also invite you to join a new research network that we are starting next month uh, with mental health care research. Um, and then we've got a couple webinars coming up next week, actually. So next Monday, uh, addressing spirituality as part of Mira Palliative Care, both the QR code there and the bit.ly. You can register for free. And then on Thursday, the qualitative analysis of the role of experience and perspective of spiritual health practitioners in psychedelic assisted therapy. That's with Caroline Peacock. And that's at Thursday at two. Also, you can click on the QR code. Um, if you have found any of our webinars to be of benefit, any of our resources to be of benefit, we encourage you to make a contribution by the end of the year, we're, sit, we're at 70% of our goal, and we would be most grateful for your generosity. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Chaba Salaji, the Director of Spirit, the Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. Chaba? Hi. Um, back in everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Andy. Um, I'm just going to let uh, Ben get started with our presentation, and then at the beginning, we'll have introductions uh, included as well. So, Ben. Uh, Thank you. We're glad that you're all here with us today. It's an honor to be together to discuss this important topic. Just to give you a sense of the lay of the land of where we're going today, we're going to spend some time setting out the groundwork for our conversation of why we're having this conversation, why we're looking at chaplaincy in the role of doing these religious exemption requests and serving on these committees. We're going to look a little bit at the research that we con conducted as a team exploring these conversations, the challenges, the strengths that came out of it for chaplains and chaplain leaders. 
can talk about the tension in that work and how that can be a difficult thing, but also a blessing and an opportunity. Then we're also gonna look at the implications for this, how we move forward in promoting chaplaincy as integrated into the inter interdisciplinary teams, not just in our units, but also within the administration of hospitals and the opportunity that we really saw through this work. So some of our objectives for today are to describe the complexities and opportunities religious exemption committees offer chaplains. Explore chaplains care in an increasingly divided world. And then discuss the future opportunities for chaplains embedding in the organizational systems of healthcare. How can they do that beyond just a particular unit, but really into the whole system of the hospital? So a couple, maybe not ground rules, but ideas of what we're doing here to have a sense of what's important, what this session is and what it isn't. This is an opportunity to think about a complex issue and its implications for our spiritual care, for the work that we do each and every day. The time for us to review this research that we conducted and explore what the religious exemption request process was like for many chaplain and chaplain leaders being involved in granting those requests. It's a time to focus on the opportunities and lessons learned from that, not just how the research was, but what happened, how was that role seen and, and felt by those chaplains who were involved in that. This time is not a time for political or ideological debate. Um, there's a lot of, of baggage and conversation around this issue. And so we wanna make sure that we're focused on the research and the opportunity for learning and growth out of it rather than making a political conversation about it. And we're also not here to, to make a judgment on the vaccine mandates or the exemption process, whether it was good or bad. We just wanted to talk about and focus on what it was like for the chaplains going through that and what we learned from that. So why did we do this study? That, that's always the question that comes to mind when you start a study. And for us, there are kind of three parts that were important. You know, we had seen throughout the pandemic, chaplains became so important in the roles in their communities of helping make these decisions around the religious exemption process. We're seeing news articles all the time about chaplains' role in healthcare and how it was really helping support and care for associates, for the patients, their families, their loved ones. And so we wanted to explore more of what that experience was like for chaplains who were involved in this process. We are also aware that many chaplains had not been trained to be a part of making these big committee decisions about people's uh, mandate and the, whether they were granted an exemption or not. And then the other piece that was really important to us is each of us had some way that this process had touched us personally that we wanted to really explore and think through having seen it from the inside or seen it from the colleagues that we had going through it personally, um, kind of processing it, what was that experience like for other chaplains to bring voice to that challenge and that strength and opportunity that came out of it? And so we came together as a team. And so I'm going to let the team introduce themselves. Um, like I said, I'm Ben. I serve as a manager of spiritual care for Ascension in Michigan. And then the rest of the team will just go through. I'll let Chaba go and then Jeannie. Hey, my name is Chaba Siraji. I'm a Director of Transforming Chaplaincy and Director of Research Assistant Professor at Rush University. Jeannie Werpsa. I'm the Program Director and Clinical Ethicist for Medical Ethics at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in downtown Chicago. I also teach at the McLean Center for Clinical Ethics. Um, and here at our Center for Bioethics and Humanities. And then Paul was also on our team. He is not a part of our webinar today, but he serves as a research chaplain in, uh, at Fair U up in Minnesota. And I'm Kim Palmer. Uh, the real name is Patricia. That's why that's on there. That's the official name. Um, I'm the manager of research projects in spiritual health with Woodruff uh, Health Sciences Center at Emory University. That's sort of a part-time contractual uh, position for me as I'm also partially in retirement. And I'm Carla Price. I'm the manager for pastoral care here at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. I'm also a certified educator candidate for ACPE. 
this is a great team that we had a lot of fun working together on this. And so we hope that this is an opportunity for you to appreciate and enjoy some of the, the learning that we had along the way. I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie to continue talking a little bit about the process of getting here. Great. And I actually can't see the slides that are being run. So I am going to say next slide, but I'm using my own deck just to go through it. Um, we should be on the slide that says U.S. COVID-19 pandemic, yes? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So sorry, technical problems. Um, I want to take folks back. We probably don't want to go back to the pandemic, but let's go back and remember the context in which we, uh, um, in which the study took place. So if you see the red line in the middle of the slide, you'll see the time period in which we actually finally got the vaccine, right? We were, everyone was waiting for it. Healthcare workers were hoping it was going to come out. Um, many in the public, again, were just praying and hoping that something would be passed. And the, um, the Federal Drug Administration, of course, expedited this process and we wound up having a, a vaccine. But as you'll see in this slide, the number of deaths that were occurring, right? The number of cases were rising up and down, different waves of this. So again, just to take us back, this is, we were crushed, if you'll remember. Um, it was a time like none other. Next slide, please. So it is around that time, <clears throat> once the vaccination was approved, that the Biden administration passed the emergency rule that made mandatory for healthcare workers uh, vaccination by January 2021. And this was uh, very quickly challenged in many courts, right? Um, at first, we tried to extend this beyond just healthcare workers, but at least for most of us in our healthcare settings, in hospitals, um, and in nursing homes, it was required that we become vaccinated, um, which is, again, what led to this challenging situation of what about folks who, for medical or religious reasons, um, did not want to get the vaccine. Next slide, please. So vaccine hesitancy. Um, is has been around for a very long time, right? Um, despite the excuse me, availability of vaccines. Um, and what I think really interesting is religion itself is cited as the third global driver by the World Health Organization of vaccine hesitancy. So it wasn't just COVID where people sought religious exemptions. It was, it has been historically many other vaccines. Next slide, please. Um, in the United States, again, we'll move back from the global context to where we are right now. We have always had the ability to carve out some um, ability to accommodate um, religious liberty rights. And this is writ into our Constitution in the First Amendment, as you can see here. Next slide, please. Laws have been passed to, again, protect employees' religious rights to prevent discrimination and to mandate re reasonable accommodation. So the law does require that an employer um, reasonably accommodate religious beliefs and practices, unless doing so would cause more than a minimal burden on the operations of the employer's business. Um, so again, we have in place already many other kinds of religious accommodations. We allow for wearing particular head coverings or other religious dress, employees cannot be forced to participate in certain religious activities. Um, uh, there's some ability, again, to ask for specific holidays off. Again, if this request does not unduly burden the employer um, and the, the business of the work. And then, of course, the right to conscientious objection and uh, healthcare worker conscientious objection laws have been replete throughout. I think most states have them and most institutions have policies to protect that. So let's just think a little bit more, looking at, next slide, the Title VII, the EEOC, right? This is where this comes from. And it actually prohibits religious discrimination in the workplace, as I said, unless there are reasonable accommodation. The challenge that came to the fore during the pandemic, and as we were looking at these requests from fellow coworkers and from, you know, throughout our institutions, was what actually counts as religious? And you'll notice by these definitions up here, that religious is a very broad definition under the law. Religious beliefs don't need to be logical consistent. Um, they don't even need to be affiliated with a particular religious denomination. 
And again, it's within that person's own scheme of things. Is this a sincere belief that parallels what we would think of as a traditional religious belief? So again, our chaplains and other folks on the committees who were looking at these requests had before them this challenge of figuring out were the beliefs, were the requests that were being presented to us religious under this broad definition, or were they politically grounded? Were they grounded in some other um, kind of source or re um, uh, reason? Next slide, please. Title seven also says that these beliefs should be sincere, right? What are the sincere beliefs that people hold? And yet, as they lay out the, the laws about how we're supposed to think about sincerity, they really constrict the employer's ability to, um, to determine what counts as sincere. It's sincere, it's a largely a matter of individual credibility. The courts and the commissions should not be in the business of deciding whether we hold these religious beliefs um, for proper reasons. People can even decide all of a sudden that they want to hold on to this belief when they never before have proclaimed it. So this is the context again for our committee members and our chaplains who were part of those when they had to consider these written requests that our institutions asked for. Next slide, please. So again, take, let's go back. Who actually opposed the COVID-19 vaccine? And this is very important because you'll see as we look at if you can unpack this graph a little bit, the persons who did not want the vaccine were largely, the highest prevalence were white evangelical Republicans. Um, so there was this conflation during this time between political affiliation and religious beliefs. And we all know this, this time became highly, highly politically divisive. So this is the context again in which our committees were being asked to look at a specific employee's um, request. Next slide, please. Healthcare workers, by and far, had a larger acceptance of the COVID-19 vaccine than the general public, right? There was some opposition, right, specifically among the, um, the general public, but some healthcare workers shared this, right, concerns about this new vaccine's efficacy. Was it really um, safe? Is this just the government trying to infringe on our personal rights? Um, being a physician, having more advanced education, and previous compliance and adherence to uh, vaccination requests actually was asso associated during this time with greater vaccine acceptance. Initially, among healthcare workers, and I remember this, um, we did a lot of town hall meetings to try to invite our healthcare workers who were from more marginalized po populations, there was an increased resistance among Black, Hispano, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian healthcare workers. But that actually shifted um, once some of our work was done and subsequent studies actually looking at the distrust of healthcare workers um, by minority communities showed that it was not actually this community among us who was opposing the vaccine or asking for these religious accommodations. Next uh, slide, please. So again, what counts as religious? How are we gonna figure this out? This was the, the rhetoric during this time. And many, most healthcare, I mean, excuse me, most religious denominations, if you recall, supported everyone in getting vaccinated to take care of our neighbor, to protect others out of love for one another. Um, there were even the Catholics who initially were somewhat um, mixed about their opposition, changed that, right? And um, reversed that, but yet this concern still came up. So when we look specifically, next slide please, at the reasons why um, people who were religious were asking for accommodations, we saw these appear. And we saw this again in our study as well. Um, these vaccines were used developing stem cell lines using aborted fetuses. People would cite that, um, again, it's God who gets to de decide my health and control things. I don't take action, including vaccinating myself against um, a potential threat. People who believed in faith healing, people who cited that their body is frankly the temple of God, and so this is a potentially harmful substance. Some people appeal to direct revelation. I prayed about it, and God said, 
you know, this is not okay. Not right for me to put this in my body. Almost the equivalent of like healthcare conscience, right? Um, there was, there were some um, folks who claimed a Western plot that the vaccine was used, being used to sterilize Muslim women. And there was a high association in the community between those who thought about this as the end times and those who were resistant to vaccine. Next slide, please. Okay, so thanks, uh, Jeannie. Um, so with that great background and setup for uh, why we were launching into this study, uh, talk a little bit about our methods. Um, we uh, conducted a mixed methods study, which included both quantitative and qualitative uh, data collection and analysis uh, using a cross-sectional survey. Our uh, recruitment came largely online through uh, U.S. professional chaplaincy organizations, through their um, membership lists that we were able to email or access email, uh, social media platforms and, and things like that. And uh, also did some targeted outreach to leaders of spiritual care departments with the thought that what we were aiming for was a nationally representative sample and trying to target people who we thought would have a high likelihood of being um, involved in the actual work of evaluating this re these religious accommodation requests with respect to getting waivers of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, to be eligible for the study, a uh, chaplain had to be employed as a healthcare chaplain in the US uh, from December 2020 through the time of the survey. And they had to have participated in review of employee requests for religious exemption. Um, we collected the data from June 1st to July 15th in 2022 and got uh, 76 responses um, that we were able to analyze that came from 38 states uh, throughout every region of the US. Next slide. So in our mixed methods uh, survey, we included, of course, quantitative or closed ended questions. And these were um, eliciting information on demographics and, uh, and uh, individuals work setting, uh, not only what type of facility they were in, but you know, whether or not the, their healthcare facility was religious or secular, a uh, variety of types of things about their work, their years of experience, um, their role and their credentials, for example, whether they were board certified, uh, whether they were, um, you know, a manager of a department or um, a uh, educator in CPE. Um, the committee makeup and the function of that committee that they served on in reviewing those uh, co-worker requests. So uh, who was on the committee, uh, how often the committee met, those types of things. And then um, their experience of vaccine-related work activities. So uh, what types of support did they offer in this process? What level and types of distress were they experiencing? Um, what was their self-rated effectiveness and had they felt prepared to do this work? Um, was the work meaningful and to what degree? And did this uh, work have any effect on the relationships or their role or their perceptions um, or their, uh, their um, interactions with their organization as a whole? And then the qualitative or open-ended questions, uh, people were able to type in answers. And uh, th these were things including, what was your unique contribution as a chaplain? What gaps in knowledge or skill did you encounter and how did you address those or fill those? What made the role challenging or distressing? You know, uh, opportunity to either expand details on what they had said in the qu quantitative uh, part of the survey or to um, indicate additional things that had not been offered as choices. And then they were able to explain how they were effective um, or helpful to the employees. They were able to explain how or why the experience was meaningful and then given an opportunity uh, sort of open-ended if there was anything else that they wanted to share. And I think one of the real powerful um, parts of this study uh, is in the methods, in using these mixed methods, because as we asked, uh, quantitative closed-ended questions, each section was immediately followed by one of these open-ended questions. So, you know, you can check off on a list what types of support you provided, and then here's a text box. Tell us about that. What was your experience of it? And what ways were it helpful? That type of thing. So very good kind of rich data that we were able to um, get out of that from this uh, uh, combination of quantitative and qualitative data. Next slide. 
Uh, for the analysis on the quantitative data, uh, we use descriptive statistics, so indicating the frequency and percentage of uh, people who are in our sample by you know, race, uh, religion, type of facility, that type of thing. And then also we were able to quantify the types of support offered by the chaplain and the degree to which it uh, created distress, the types of distress it created, um, and whether or not it was uh, a meaningful um, experience to them uh, providing this uh, role of evaluating these uh, requests. We also did some analysis to look for uh, statistically significant associations, in particular between the chaplain's position on mandatory vaccination, that is, yes, it should be required, um, yes, it should be required as long as there are religious exemptions, or uh, no, it shouldn't um, be required. And so their position on mandatory vaccination uh, against their overall level of distress and against individual sources of distress, whether there were any uh, correlations there. Also, uh, the analysis for associations between meaningfulness of participating in these exemption reviews and their overall level of distress or the individual sources of distress that they might have endorsed. The qualitative um, analysis included thematic analysis of all the free text responses in which we identified themes and sub-themes, aggregated these into domains. Uh, to do that work, we had four coders working in pairs. Uh, one, one half of each pair was somebody who was um, experienced in qualitative analysis. The other half of the pair is somebody who was um, experienced in the actual chaplaincy uh, work and in the reviews. And then uh, if there were any discrepancies, uh, those were res uh, resolved with the assistance of the principal investigator. And then, uh, like I say, in the strength of the these methods, we then really integrated the qualitative findings with the quantitative. So we were able to say uh, what types of distress people had, for example, how what degree of meaning they ascribed to the work, but also to really flesh that out with some, some rich descriptions of um, of what that experience was like for people. Next slide. So thanks, Kim. Um, as we look at the findings that this type of support offered, I'd like to just uh, mention that in addition to reviewing the exemption requests, chaplains actually provided support to those colleagues, their coworkers, peers, those who were considering a religious exemption. And this meant that healthcare chaplains, they were actively engaged with others and providing direct emotional and ethical support, either when they were doing the interview or when the requester informally asked um, the coworker who was considering submitting a request. And so we found that 81.6% uh, identified the, uh, addressing emotional and spiritual, uh, spiritual distress, that 62.2% uh, expressed that helping coworkers explore how their religious beliefs apply to this COVID-19 vaccination as well as the 50% who said help, helping coworkers weigh the pros and cons of applying for exemption were uh, part of their duties as, as a healthcare chaplain. Next slide. This matters because it led to four different types of stress that we'll talk about. The first is theological, in that uh, with the theological distress, you'll see there that the, one of the cause of distress was having to affirm the religious beliefs and exemptions of those they believe would cause harm to their neighbors because of the religious exemption uh, granted. With the, the theological types of distress, the core belief here was that um, the coworkers were in conflict or uh, particularly when they thought that the core beliefs of the chaplain or even the coworker uh, felt compromised. You'll see the different percentages there that 92.1% of the coworkers use religion as a substitute for other reasons, that 64.5% of the coworkers misunderstanding of core beliefs of their tradition, 31.6% we found religious beliefs, worldview of coworkers conflicted with the chaplain's framework. And then there was the many who expressed uh, frustration or anger at the politicization or of the religion and the proof test texting without sincerity. Next slide. With the ethical types of distress in the findings, this kind of showed up when there was a similar to a, like a duty to care. Uh, you'll see that 52% of those granted an exemption would be more likely to spread the virus, that there were 38.2% fearing coworkers would lose their jobs, again, that duty to care, and then 
of, of those uh, surveyed talked about worrying that the institution, institution would be short staffed. Um, moving on to the next slide. We found that there were procedural types of distress. You'll see there that one of the comments was that our legal office stated that every request had to be approved. And this makes the work of the exemption committee an exercise of processing only and not a supportive one for the employee. So there were uh, those who felt the review process was unfair. A minority felt that the framework for deciding on the exemption was inconsistently applied. There were some chaplains who identified that they were distressed because of the confidential nature of the review process. And then there was free tax comments identifying frustrations with the pro forma nature of the review at some of those institutions. Moving on to the next slide, we talk about the effect of the relationships. And even though there was only a small percentage, 15.8% talked about um, a negative impact on relationships, when you look at how those, what their comments were with regard to those relationships, that was pretty substantial. So for instance, um, you see there with the disappointment led to a, a viewing of coworkers differently. It was difficult to maintain a trusting relationship with colleagues who had applied for what appeared to be an ill-reasoned or insincere exemption. And then there was verbal abuse that some of the chaplains, uh, verbal or even verbal abuse or even pressure that some of the chaplains indicated they experienced in this process that impacted their relationships, as well as those chaplains who felt that they had a, a difficult time just suspending their own judgment or suspending their own ethical or religious framework in order to, uh, to respond to those uh, exemptions. Next slide. And then the last finding um, is with regard to the moral injury. There were contributing factors and protective factors that we kind of fleshed out, but with the contributing factors, there was repeated exposure to the volume of requests that came in that led to the, the moral injury. It was an unfamiliar role with 95% of our respondents to this survey. They were unclear of rules for review. There were the conflict with the chaplain's position on the mandatory vaccinations. And then there was the moral injury when it came to use and abuse of religion for political needs, uh, political ends. But then the protective factors kind of help balance that. And so um, when we ask, what do you do with this information? The, the findings showed that uh, meaning making really did have a higher uh, uh, comparison with the distress that the, uh, that the surveyor or the uh, surveyed person responded to, that they had external validation from the org organization um, and that they were able to bracket their own beliefs in order to appreciate and respect those different uh, views that were different from their own, while they had the ability to hold competing moral frameworks in tension. Um, so those were some of the findings that, the, that we found with this survey. Thank you. So <clears throat> as we are uh, wrapping up the presentation, uh, I'm just gonna, talk about um, and highlight a few implications and questions for us to consider and, and perhaps continue our dialogue around. So um, one, one of these themes that we have heard is about um, uh, different skills that chaplains and chaplain leaders uh, may have needed during this time. And, and this situation uh, challenged uh, participants to hone and expand their skills uh, better they were leadership skills, uh, ethics skills, how to um, approach these uh, their participation, the decision making with ethical frameworks, um, chaplaincy, spiritual care skills, um, organizational skills, and addressing moral distress. Um, I think all around the organization, whether in the committee with committee members, um, with fellow chaplains, with, with employees, um, all around. Um, so. Um, and the, and the other uh, uh, skills or, or in terms of the approaches that um, chaplains had to um, either develop or, or rely on um, um, uh, is to, to step into these roles with their professional confidence and as well as with appropriate support. Uh, some people had uh, support systems in place to draw on, uh, other people have uh, felt alienated uh, or needing that support or wishing 
there would be more support uh, be available uh, from others uh, as well as in terms of support to learn new skills and knowledge. Um, and um, and just uh, that's something to note around you know what skills we can learn now in a in a post acute crisis environment that in some ways positions us well uh, for uh, times when we really have to scramble and and really jump into uh, functioning in different ways uh, in our organizations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and. Um, and the other implication around implications or takeaways around um, this, this whole idea of getting involved in unexpected ways. Um, for even for leaders who have had similar roles around flu vaccination, um, because that's not um, um, that's been around and, and some chaplain chaplain leaders have served in those committees to review exemption requests, but this was a whole different ballgame, a whole different situation. Um, and so uh, being open and, and equipped to to get involved in an unexpected way and 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 also kind of uh, build a plane as, as as flying, kind of learning the skills and and, um, and and scrambling as probably was true for other aspects of COVID, um, figuring out okay, so we're doing this, then let's figure out how to do this well. Um, it really uh, opened up opportunities to be involved as an expert. Um, uh, providing education um, informally, formally uh, around this topic, providing spiritual care, listening, uh, support skills, as well as leadership and advocacy. Uh, I think it was a really uh, time, again, COVID in other ways too was a time and opportunity to really step up as leaders within organizations uh, for, for chaplaincy leaders. And, and again, this, this question that came uh, from our participants, but I think that's an ongoing question we might need to ponder, uh, is to, to building systems of support uh, for, for, for each other, for fellow leaders, for fellow chaplains, when we have to jump in, uh, in an ex functioning in an unexpected role, where can we go? Uh, sometimes that is we don't have bandwidth left over to build new relationships or build new systems, so what systems and relationships we can have in place when we are asked to do uh, um, uh, um, uh, do this leadership contribution. Um, and, and also think about uh, kind of the unexpected ways uh, as not something that is really limiting or pivoting us away from being a chaplain, but, but really something that, that uh, even at first glance, it might not feel like immediately. Uh, but a lot of these new roles uh, draw on the breadth and depth of our training and skills. While we are also learning new things, but it's a bon both end experience that, oh yeah, I have a lot to build on and draw on in these situations. Uh, it, I'm not starting from scratch. I, I do have the skills, even if I use them in different contexts and for different purposes, as well as uh, learning new things uh, in the process. And especially in crisis situations and emotionally charged situations, we know very well, even with the patients and families uh, we serve, that is, it's not an easy to learn new things when we are feeling distressed or when we are in crisis mode. But, but focusing on maintaining that, that openness of seeing what I already have to contribute, as well as learning new skills. Um, next uh, slide, please. Um, so, and as we talked about, uh, talk about drawing on our chaplain's expertise, um, uh, some of the, the themes uh, may make us uh, talk more and think more about uh, different ways of, of building uh, on our expertise. Um, that, that we are, even in these committee meetings and committee functioning when there was this expectation to function as an expert in religious spiritual issues, but, but really the chaplaincy expertise shown through in treating others kindly empathetically, non-judgmentally uh, during these conversations, whether committee conversations or conversations with individual um, uh, co-workers. Um, and, and, and claiming claiming our overall expertise in, in anything that has to do with interpersonal, human, spiritual aspects of care and organizational processes. We are not alien to this, even if we didn't have a seat at the table before, we can step up with, with that confidence. Um, uh, this uh, this role in these committees have really 
uh, stretched and 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 um, and made people uh, make use of their empathic uh, flexibility. Uh, how to work with and care for all persons, uh, people who think very different and believe very different things, uh, people who are very similar, as well as uh, with my own self in this process and have empathy all around. It is sometimes hard work to to practice that intentionally and 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 providing care in situations where our buttons get pushed again it happens in clinical settings too but um, the intensity of of this situation uh, was probably even greater and and we as we read the news or or just go about our our life we are aware that you know uh, religious and politically divisive public discourse continues uh, chaplains and healthcare organizations um, are not uh, outside of that public discourse. Uh, so as we continue serving in this context, um, how we can be mindful of the tension, whether it's tension in between persons or tension within, um, and, and how to increase our awareness um, of where this tension lies. And tension in itself is not good or bad, it is what it is, but being able to notice and work through that and work with that, again, requires our chaplaincy expertise, both to bring what we have, as well as further hone our capacities to do so. Um, and, and even though when we step into unexpected and new roles, there can be an alignment with uh, staying grounded in our identity, in our skills as chaplains and spiritual care practitioners, uh, and, 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 and aligning those and, and finding the bridge, even if, again, at first may feel like, I'm not sure you know, how that fits into the chaplain role um, or how to feel into my, maybe my typical role, how I understand my clinical role and my leadership role. Uh, but again, going back to staying grounded in our professional um, identity and your professional skills that, that helps uh, uh, manage and navigate this process. I'm going to turn it back to Ben. Um, Thank you all. Um, we've reached the time where we have an opportunity for some question and answers, so I invite you to use your question box to type any questions you have for the panel here, and we'll do our best to answer those. Um, as we wait for questions to come in, one that I'd love to pose, pose to the rest of you, and I'll answer too, but what was one of the most surprising things to you in the, the findings when we were going through, uh, just seeing the results from our peers and colleagues around the country? So as my colleagues think of their answers, I'll give mine. Um, one of the things that I was most surprised of was the sense of um, competence that many chaplain leaders had when they were going into this, that they felt like while this was new uncharted territory and challenging they also felt like they were either prepared or had the ability to become prepared relatively quickly to serve in these settings and i think that really spoke highly to the resiliency of our chaplaincy and the ways that we are trained and able to to react very quickly to move into places where we weren't expecting to be uh mere moments or hours before others i think it wasn't um I expected to see contradicting experiences, like of the wide spectrum of experiences um, from our participants, um, you know, between persons as well as within one person's, you know, thinking through the spectrum of experiences. I think I was I was struck by the magnitude, like you know, the you know it's the worst and soul sucking and it's and it's awful and um, to the point where others were saying, you know, it's the like. It's the it's the best like it's it's the most meaningful I'm 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 doing what I'm called to do and just and everything in between so I was expecting a contrast in a broad spectrum but I think the spectrum was even broader or more intense than I initially anticipated to see. I'll follow up on that. What I was I was going to say exactly what you said, Chava, but add that I think it also revealed something we knew little about, which was the variation among institutions on how these were handled, right? So some of the people who expressed the greatest distress found themselves in organizations that were 
inconsistently applying things, um, the, the law, that were really confused about how the law should be applied. They had biases embedded, whereas other institutions, again, were, you know, doing this pro forma thing. So I, I don't think any of us knew actually what was going on with other institutions because all of that is so confidential. Um, so I, I, w I found that interesting. I was not surprised, but I have to say, I just continue to be struck by how well chaplains navigated the politicization of the religious discourse, right? Um, yes, it impacted them. Yes, it was distressing, but somehow they didn't get sucked down into the morass. I mean, this again speaks to our training, right? We're actually able to do a lot of that bracketing, remain non-judgmental, um, really sustain compassion. So it, again, I think it speaks to one of the strengths of our training. For me, I was surprised at the actual number of folks who responded. I love the fact that we had such a, a large group of individuals who responded from all over, from different uh, types of healthcare uh, type facilities and hospitals. And so just the sheer number of folks, it's, it's almost like they wanted a platform to talk about this because there was so much confidentiality built, built around it. And to have this opportunity to share with others and to see where it would lead, I thought uh, that was interesting to me. That was a surprise to me. Yeah, I'll just add, um, Jeannie spoke mostly uh, what I was thinking, the, the surprise for me came in seeing how um, meaningful people felt that it was to move into this really conflicted, intention-filled space and uh, help remind everybody who is in the orbit of making these decisions about the humanity of the person that it just didn't become whether you agreed or disagreed with their reasons. It was about taking care of the person who was making the request. Thank you all. Um, one question here is, where do you hope to see chaplains get further embedded into administrative settings going forward, uh, organizationally within, you know, we talk about those competencies, like uh, the OL competencies, report certification, of how do you do organizational leadership? Where do you see this part helping us grow into that and, and more embed as a, as a kind of classroom example of this. I might say one thing, one place that uh, I would like to see chaplains more regularly included is in um, providing kind of a moment of centering reflection at the beginning of, um, you know, meetings that involve uh, administrative leadership so that the uh, the mission of the organization can remain in the forefront and sort of as a reminder that there are uh, you know uh, real people um, who are going to be affected by these decisions and to remember the humanity of these people and uh, and also to have uh, administrators be aware that the chaplain become aware that the chaplain is also there for their needs you know because everybody has a family and families are messy and people have conflicts in their jobs, they have all kinds of things. So um, the, the more that we can be sort of visible in the front of the room, even just for a brief centering moment, I think the better off the whole system will be. And, and your question makes me think about um, ways chaplain can get involved in decision-making situations. So, so leadership and, and we, we often, you know, organize provision of services and, and we, generate buy-in and work with champions and allies in the organization, but where we can um, use our interpersonal spiritual care expertise to, and our leadership expertise to be part of decision-making processes. Or you know, in these situations as chaplains were part of that often decision-making or evaluative group committee work, um, but I would not be surprised to hear that not many of them had actually input in the process itself or felt like they could give feedback in a way that was heard and taken by the organization and generating change. So even in this 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 um, uh, this particular situation or context of the uh, the religious accommodations, you know how we can also 
influence decision making. Like we are not the top decision makers, and we all know, but how we can use our leadership skills to influence decision making, influence changing processes, setting up processes in a way that are more humane, more empathetic, more inclusive uh, for our uh, healthcare workers and our patients. And and one of the ways that I've I've seen or I believe that I think leadership might use the the professional chaplain going forward is not just at the bedside with the patient, but also with the staff. I I see a growth or an expansion of that where chaplains are now um, being embedded in HR departments because we now see that um, we already know that chaplains help with the spirituality of the patient, but when you help with the spirituality and the well-being and the emotional safety and uh, of, of the staff there's value add there. And so I, I'm seeing more chaplains now being um, being utilized in that role for, that leadership is utilizing chaplains in that role for staff support, not just whether it's, uh, not just at the bedside for the patient. Thank you all. Uh, someone else is writing here. Serving on the committee at my hospital was overall tiring and unpleasant. I feel guilty and sad for the employees who were terminated because the religious ex accommodation was denied. Did other chaplains experience this? I think we can all say resoundingly yes. That was a really uh, wide overarching theme within what we read, that this was a very challenging experience, though not universally. There were people who felt fulfilled through it, they still felt very challenged by it and said that it was a, it was a both and. Uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that a little more deeply. All right, another question here. Did you find any resources that would be helpful in developing new skills or support unique situations like this? I'll jump in. I think that we didn't find the resources. We found the internal training that already kind of helped chaplains. I mean, it's as if they had in their, you know, toolbox what they needed. I think what we discovered that they didn't have that might have been helpful was what um, Carla spoke to earlier was a community a peer group, someplace where they could actually have been sharing these experiences with one another. So leaders connecting, managers connecting. Um, we know it was confidential, but there still is potentially the way for, through some of our professional organizations, to provide forums specific for managers, for others involved in these unique situations, to support one another, to brainstorm, to find out about what they were actually doing at their institutions. That seemed to be lacking. Um, I, I don't think our professional organizations have done much kind of from on high proactively to develop those peer networks of support. And I'm not talking just I'm having a distressing day about this patient. I'm talking about this level of, again, um, challenging situations. And I, I, I do echo that, you know, the importance of that consultative network where you have other leaders who are able to um, hear you as well as just ask questions that are helpful, uh, share some of their experiences, how they have approached things. Um, and I'm going to do a, a, a plug-in for our program. Uh, Transforming Chaplaincy does have a spiritual care leadership management uh, certificate program that is helpful. Um, and, and what we hear is that it gets lonely being not just sometimes the chaplain profession is not always fitting back uh, as well as in the culture, but even being a department leader or a chaplaincy leader and and learning together and and going from a, a an individual clinical chaplain to uh, becoming a, a, a chaplaincy and organizational leader uh, that is a development process and 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 having to do that having to be able to do that with other chaplain leaders that's a really great environment for for learning um, so so spaces like that and there are other uh, training spaces where you can be with like-minded uh, people who are, again, similar enough to have that cohesive learning as well as different enough to, to challenge you and being able to provide uh, new perspectives on your work. 
Yeah, um, I think the, the connection and being able to develop those networks is so important. And I might just add, especially for people who are the only chaplain at their institution. Yeah. Yeah, I think to echo that all, that, that isolating feeling that so many chaplains have had throughout the, the COVID experience, the more we can break down those barriers and have these conversations and connect with other peers across the country, and around the world gives us that opportunity to really improve not just our our interactions but actually make our profession better help us to think about how to work together for best practices how to move this forward um, and so with that we have time for one more question here before we end if you think about the research that we've done and talked about here today where would you like to dig a little deeper, go a little further, kind of extrapolating off of this study? What would you like to see more research about? Hmm. Well, I have, I have an answer that's sort of not an answer <laughs> because it's not really possible at this point. You know, COVID provided such a, um, microcosm window of so many different types of interactions and processes. One of the things I think that we were interested in was um, how the chaplain was perceived by the other members of the uh, uh, of the review committees um, dealing with these religious accommodation requests. Um, but you know it's difficult at this point to go back and, and gather that data because now we're a couple more years removed from it. I think one of the persistent questions that we see in our profession is this question about our value, right? Um, and we haven't, we've done a couple isolated studies with mixed results about do chaplains contribute to patient satisfaction or not, kind of what's really our value added, right? And it was just so striking to me that in this, this study, chaplains found so much meaning in kind of being at the table and contributing their expertise, which speaks to that kind of underlying the opposite, right? Which is on some level, chaplains really still don't always claim a place at the table and are, are feeling siloed and not as appreciated or not as recognized as they could. So I think maybe something goes along with what you said about how others perceive us, how do our leadership perceive us still, how can we demonstrate kind of outcomes, right? Um, what would those outcomes be? I'm doing some similar work with clinical ethicists. What is the value added of a clinical ethics service? What is, what's the value added really of chaplaincy and how do we measure that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Jenny, I love your, your response to that. Uh, that. That would be in line with what I'm thinking as well. If just, just pursuing that and just being able to pinpoint that just a little more precisely the value add of the chaplain. I'm always curious about that. We think we know what value we add, right? Well, of course we make a difference, right? I think I would like to see it, more research around the connection between those, those competencies chaplains felt that they were able to draw upon and how those connect to the CPE curriculum that they went through and how does CPE prepare them well for, for stepping into these challenges and how much of it is just picked up along the way um, so that by the time they got to a point where they're in a leadership position stepping into this, they felt comfortable. Um, and just kind of that longitudinal where those pieces fit together. So part of the reason you'd like to see that is that you could also then do, to think about that stage post-CPE, getting a job. What kind of professional training do we really need like I think about that for chaplains who are pulled into the work of ethics, those who are pulled into the work of leadership, those who are going to be doing staff care. How do we develop curriculum? Again, CP can't accomplish everything at the basic level. What do we really need to put into place? Yeah. And, and I think that, that well, yeah. Go ahead. And, and I echo that in terms of like what is the post CP post board post board certification trajectory looks for looks like for professional development. And then in beyond the, you know, the 50 hours in the categories, like, do we have some models or blueprints for people to, this is where to go to get these skills and, and what are the environments of for intentional and relational development, right? So CPE does give that a lot of ways, 
but getting certified or having been practicing for years doesn't mean that we don't need that i think even we need it even more in a different way in a different setting so how we how we develop those understand what skills needed but then also developing um, um, environments and systems for that ongoing development that we need or any profession needs um, uh, to grow well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for this webinar. We're glad that you could be here. Uh, please continue to join us in webinars that come in the future. I hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.